Hi everyone, welcome back to lecture 3 of the National Scale Fluvial Geomorphology Characterization Series where today we'll be taking a look at river migration at critical bridge infrastructure in the Philippines. So just as a brief overview of what we'll be looking at today, in lecture 2 we focused on using remotely sent satellite imagery to assess channel mobility and river migration and today we'll really be trying to describe a practical application of using this approach to look at river change around critical bridges in the Philippines. So first of all, we're going to take a quick look at the different flood and geomorphic hazards that we can find at critical bridge infrastructure. Uh, we'll look at the bridge inventory geodatabase from the DPWH. I'll talk through the Google Earth Engine workflow that we've been developing uh, as part of this work. We'll look at how similarity coefficients, such as a jacquard index, can be used to indicate river platform changes. As well as that, we'll look at an application called River Width Cloud that can be used to measure changes in the active channel river width. And then we'll bring this all together to look at the national scale assessment of channel changes at bridges in the Philippines, provide a few recommendations and then a number of take home messages. So the key themes of today really will be trying to build a really detailed bridge inventory geodatabase and, and supplement that with multi temporal river platform adjustments. So you can see an example here at the Karakai Bridge on Biloran Island that was heavily damaged uh, during Typhoon Aduja in 2017. Uh, so this is one of the geomorphic effects, one of the geomorphic hazards that we see at bridge infrastructure. We'll show how this low cost remote sensing technique using the Landsat series can be used to look at changes in channel plan form um, over multiple timescales and then we'll produce a, an assessment of river migration of bridges in the Philippines at the national scale. And as part of the rationale for this work, we just want to note that bridges are really vulnerable nodes for flood and geomorphic hazards. Um, so the vulnerable nodes and transport and utility networks that are exposed to flood related hazards more than any form of infrastructure. So the failure and damage of bridges is a costly process and it can cause really lengthy interruptions to connections between communities. And that river migration represents a geomorphic hazard at sites of critical bridge infrastructure. And as we showed in the last lecture, uh, we're seeing really high rates of river migration in these tropical settings. So it's quite pertinent to look at river migration at the national scale. So you can just see some examples of damages to bridges in the in the three photographs here the top one Karakai bridge where we've had this is looking downstream um, so we've got a change in angle of attack of the channel here it's destroyed a river training measure regraded the the bed profile and we see lots of overland flow onto the floodplain um, as the channel expanded out of bank this is an example from Catmon bridge in the same event again we're seeing lots of channel erosion active channel widening taking place on the outer bend here. Again, damage to river training measures. And a final example here of some of the um, damages to concrete built in infrastructure. That's a bridge on the Abuan River in Isabella. And we just want to note that there are lots of different processes taking place at bridges, hydraulic processes. Um, so today we'll be talking about general scour um, that comes from river migration. And that's the removal of sediment, lowering of the bed, erosion of the bed, um, that is taking place irrespective of the bridge being there. So it's not introduced by the piers of the bridge. General scour will be taking place as a, as a form of river migration. And that can be really damaging in modifying the angle of flow attack. As you can see here, we've shifted from a flow that was attacking underneath the bridge to a laterally attacking flow. And it can accentuate local and contraction scour undermine or outflank the bridge, making the bridge redundant and reducing conveyance through the bridge. So the key point really is that in the Philippines where exposure to flooding and geomorphic risk is considerable, uh, the recent expansion of infrastructure warrants quantification of migration in the vicinity of these really valuable bridge assets. It's important to not only consider the effects of the water, but also the material that's contained within the water. So the sediment moving downstream in addition to organic material, things like bridge trunks and um, large woody debris. So here we show an example uh, from a high flow event at the Abwan Bridge in Isabella from December 2019. And we can see lots of 
uh, large woody debris material has been entrained into the floor and deposited in the bridge. So the, the water is a slurry of material bringing these um, organic debris as well. We also know that channel adjustments are a three dimensional process. We have vertical adjustments at the bed and that can pose an additional hazard through bed aggradation and bed degradation. And just to know that these accumulations of in-channel wood can pose local geomorphic hazards. Uh, we can clog and dam the flow, leading to a further rise in water level. So bridges are really vulnerable nodes uh, for both flood and geomorphic hazards. And at the event scale, we can start to look at some of these river migration hazards. So here we show an example at the Karakai Bridge on Billyran Island, just located to the lower left of the image. And we can see a before image taken from the 10th of December 2017 and a post event image from the 18th of December 2017. So associated with Typhoon Aduja, we see really large scale geomorphic changes. These include the activation of a flood channel and reworking of floodplain sediments. So we can see from a single thread channel, uh, the, the channel has moved out of bank eroded a lot of the floodplain area and really changed the, the angle of flow attack at the Karakai Bridge. You can see that this was a large event. Lots of sediment has been deposited over bank and lots of area has been inundated around the active channel. So you can see really large scale flow misalignment at the bridge opening and damage to the bridge in this example. But changes in the channel plan form don't just occur at the event scale. So here we're taking a 30 year record of Landsat satellite imagery uh, for the Bubba Lion Bridge on the Abalug River. And we can see real changes in channel plan form downstream of the bridge um, over this 30 year time period. So in the upstream section, the river is confined within the valley setting. Downstream of the bridge, um, it expands onto a, an alluvial plain where the river has much more space to laterally um, adjust and you can see real changes in the plan form configuration. So shifting from a single threaded channel, mainly single threaded channel in 1990 to this multi threaded channel and a widening of the active channel by 2020. But not all bridge sites are behaving in the same way. Here we show an example from the Magapit Bridge on the Cagayan River, again taking the same time period 1990 to 2020 and we see very little difference in the river morphology uh, between these dates. So the plan form lateral adjustments have been more limited for this example. In contrast, here we show really widespread changes in river plan form. So this takes an example from the Bukau Bridge on the Bukau River, uh, just downstream of Mount Pinatubu. And we can see that between 1990 and 2020, we've had really widespread river expansion. So associated with the volcanic eruption, uh, lots of sediment has entered the system. And this has allowed for an increase in the active channel width. So we can see quite large scale plan form adjustments here uh, that could potentially influence, influence the bridge. And unlike many countries in the world, already in existence in the Philippines is a detailed bridge inventory. So provided by the Department of Public Works and Highways, we have detailed geospatial information on over 8,000 bridges along national roads in the Philippines. This includes attribute data, including the bridge length, the year of construction, and the, the type of road over the bridge. The example on the right shows the spatial distribution of these bridges in the north of Luzon Island, including some of these attribute data, things like bridge width. So we've taken this database and filtered it to include only the largest permanent bridges um, that are greater than 200 metres in length and that cross contemporary river crossings. Uh, so the bridge database does contain bridges over roads, but we're interested in those over rivers. So we're left with 74 bridges that meet this criteria. This means that we have selected uh, 74 bridges that span 22 different provinces in the Philippines. Uh, more than 90% of the bridges were constructed since 1970, um, so quite a lot were constructed recently. Uh, quite a lot of the bridges were positioned towards the catchment outlet rather than in the channel headwaters, um, and that's just a product of the road network, especially on the round Luzon Island. 
and the bridge lengths range from 200 meters to almost 1,500 meters. So you can just see the distribution of the bridges that we are surveying in our critical bridge infrastructure database. Uh, similar to lecture two, we've developed a Google Earth Engine workflow where we can start to extract the active river channel masks using Landsat 5, 7 and 8 satellite imagery around the sites of bridges. Uh, so we have three main processing steps. First of all, masking out the cloud and producing that average image. Uh, we then classify the active river channel based on the multispectral bands. And finally, we clean and export an image um, ready to complete analysis looking at the changes in the river plan form. So we're really interested in the engineering timescale for this work. Uh, so we'll look into assess river plan form adjustments at decadal time intervals. Uh, so first of all, starting when we have Landsat 5 imagery between 1988 and 89, and then working more recently at 10 year intervals. Uh, so we have an average image produced between 1988 and 89, a second average image between 98 and 99, 2008 to 2009, and then finally the most recent image between 2018 and 19. And then to indicate the plan form adjustment over the engineering or 30 year timescale, we're comparing time period one against time period four. So for each of the 74 sites, we now have four average images um, for the different time periods. And we can start to apply similarity coefficients on these active channel masks to understand and indicate plan form adjustment. To do this, we calculate the Jacquard index, which takes the area of overlap between two images and divides that by the area of union between two images. So we'll just run through this as an example. Um, at time period one, we have the, the active channel around the bridge. At time period four, we have the same image, a different active channel area. Uh, we make a binary representation of those and compare the two so we can run a confusion matrix to understand the changes in plan form adjustment. So in the first instance, we compare presence and presence. That's um, denoted by the A here, so the area of overlap between the two images. Uh, then we also look at the instances where we have a presence in one time period and an absence in the other. So that's the example where we have presence in time period four, but an absence in time period one. In contrast, denoted by C here, that's the active channel in area in time period one, but not in time period four. So you can see a lot of the area of the active channel that has been lost in the intervening period. And then D is the absence absence that we're not interested in here. So to calculate the Jacquard ind index and indicate the similarity between the active channel masks, what we do is take the area of A, the area of overlap, and divide that by the area of union, which is the sum of A, B, and C. And using this approach, um, we can calculate the Jacquard index, which ranges between zero and one. A uh, value of one would indicate complete similarity between the two data sets. A value of zero would indicate complete dissimilarity. And this provides us with an indication of how much plan form adjustment has taken place results of that analysis at the national scale. So the map of the Philippines shows that the darker greens indicate greater plan form change at bridge sites. So the darker colours indicate a lower jacquard index. So the plan form is dissimilar at different time periods. Whereas a higher jacquard index indicates that the channel plan form is almost identical between the two. So what this really shows uh, as an example here, where the plan form isn't changing so much, we get a higher Jacquard index. Where the plan form is changing a lot through the time periods, we get a dissimilar Jacquard index. And what's notable is that the mean Jacquard index of the 30 year time period um, indicates considerable plan form adjustment through, throughout the inventory. So you can see the median average um, for the Jacquard index is less than 0.5. We've got a wide interquartile range about that data. So with the widespread of data about the median, uh, we see that there is substantial vari variation amongst the bridge sites. 
So what this really represents is that plan form adjustment and morphological behaviour is different between the different bridge sites. So different areas in the Philippines, different river systems are behaving differently um, in terms of their channel adjustment processes. And as well as looking at the area of the active channel, we can also look at the active channel width. So in this example, we use an application in Google Earth Engine called Riv Width Cloud, um, and that automatically extracts the river centerline and widths for each of the binary active channel masks. So as you can see here, we're fitting and reconstructing many thousands of active channel width measurements across the river system, uh, transects across the river, to return a spatially continuous estimate of the, the active channel width. And then we can repeat this for different time periods, different time intervals, to see how the active river channel has changed through time. So ordinarily, this would be a really time consuming process to manually digitize the width at each cross section. Um, but by using this application within Google Earth Engine, it's possible to really increase the efficiency and improve the spatial coverage for which we can apply the analysis. So just taking an example from the Bizlock catchment, here we start to quantify the active channel width using a um, temporal composite of Sentinel-2 imagery taken from 2019. And we can see the distribution of active channel width with distance downstream in the catchment, in the confined uh, sections upstream, where the valley width is narrow and the channel is confined to the bottom of the valley margin. Uh, we see narrower widths of the channel. And as we move out onto the alluvial plain, and the system becomes braided and wandering, uh, the active channel width increases. So as the channel spreads out of the alluvial plains, increased accommodation space of the river, uh, we can look at the changes in active channel width. And previously, this hasn't been possible. In this example, we start to show some results from the national scale inventory, particularly focusing on changes in active channel width. So the image on the left shows the mean active channel width between the uh, time periods that we've investigated and the darker colours represent a wider active channel. We show that there is a range of active channel widths in the vicinity of large bridges uh, with a mean active channel width around 275 metres. But this does vary by over an order of magnitude and for the different bridge sites. We then start to look at changes in active channel width through time, which we express first of all um, as the absolute value in metres. So the red areas indicate expansion at the bridge site, the blue in, in areas indicate contraction at the bridge site. And what we can see is that a number of bridges um, show no real pattern or negligible changes in the active channel width, whereas we do have a few outliers uh, where there are large scale changes in active channel width. The next approach that we take is to normalize the change in active channel width. So we divide the active channel, the change in active channel width by the active channel width at each bridge site. And again, we see the similar pattern. So here we represent changes in active channel width as a percentage change. And we start to see those sites that show expansion and contraction. And what's really important to note is that at many sites, we see no real change in active channel width. But for those outliers, we do see substantial width changes. So that's up to plus or minus 25% of the active channel width. And this does represent significant channel dynamism, uh, which could pose geomorphic hazards at bridge sites. So as a final point, it's useful to bring together the changes in channel plan form and the changes in active channel width and really consider the role of geomorphology in all of this. Uh, here we show an example of the Bubble Iron Bridge on the Abelog River, we show a false colour composite image from 1988. We show the active river channel plan form mask at time period 1 in green, and then the most recent channel plan form mask at time period 4 in purple. And then at each point along the river, we show the distribution of channel widths. So the green is indicated by time period 1, the distributions at time period 4 are represented in purple. And here we can see considerable channel expansion between the two time periods. So we showed that the Jacquard index of 0.33 represented plan form dissimilarity at this site. Uh, and overall, we see a pattern of channel expansion. So the distribution has shifted to the right, indicating an increase in active channel width. 
In terms of plan farm configuration, here we see a, a multi-threaded system reverting to a single-threaded system. Um, so through this partly confined multi-threaded wandering channel, the mean active channel plan form width has increased by almost 30%. But it's really important to note that the plan form adjustment processes are not occurring homogeneously across the vicinity of the bridge. And what I really mean by that is that the, the processes are spatially variable. We don't see much change upstream of the bridge, but we see a lot of change downstream of the bridge. Um, and it's really important to think about the local adjustments around sites of bridges. In the second example, um, we show Jones Bridge on the Cagayan River, which is in Isabella, and we show a higher jacquard index of 0.66. So this reflects some plan form changes, um, but not huge amounts of plan form change. And at the same time, we only see negligible change in the active channel width. So the distributions remain the same at both time periods. For this unconfined single threaded meandering channel, the mean active channel width has increased by only 1% and the plan form configuration was more stable. So the pattern of river plan form change at this bridge site is very different than that at the first example. Finally, we show an example from the Lumintau bridge on the Lumintau River, where the jackard index was even higher, but we did see pronounced channel contraction. So this is a much wider system with a greater area of active channel and this partly confined multi-threaded braided channel, the mean active channel width did decrease by 20%. So here we see at time period four, the distribution has shifted to the left. Overall, this shows that plan form adjustments tend to be highly localized to specific parts of river reaches in the vicinity of critical bridge infrastructure. So the changes are highly local and do not affect the entire system of the river. I think here it's quite important to link back and think about the implications for bridge management at river crossings. And for some bridges, it, we have shown significant lateral adjustment that implies the need for bridge design to begin to accommodate channel dynamism and to continue monitoring and managing um, to mitigate substantial geomorphic hazards. But not all bridges showed the same patterns of change. For other sites, the plan form remained stable and changes in channel width were more limited. So it's recognising this diversity that's important and really having a place-based understanding, knowing what's happening in the catchment and knowing what's happening upstream, downstream of the bridge site in terms of the river behaviour. We do recommend that satellite remote sensing uh, as a tool for monitoring river plan form adjustment, especially with the wealth of archival satellite imagery remote sensing data that's now available. And we suggest that these approaches could be applied to other critical infra infrastructure adjacent to rivers, things like roads, railway and pipe networks. And they could also be extended elsewhere to other dynamic riverine settings. So that completes lecture three in the series. I just want to say thanks for your attention and please do get in touch with any questions or queries. Thank you.